Welcome back to the Transform Your Mind to Transform Your Life radio show and podcast. I'm your host, Life Coach Myrna Young, and sitting in the guest chair today is Dr. Gleb Sapersky. um, Dr. Gleb is an author and a disaster avoidance expert. And today we're going to be talking on the topic, how to adapt and plan for the new abnormal after the coronavirus pandemic. Welcome, Dr. Gleb. Thank you very much for inviting me on again, Mirna. It's a pleasure. Yes, definitely my pleasure. Great, great topic. So um, let me give you some more information about Dr. Gleb. Dr. Gleb Sapersky is the author of many books. He is a returning guest on the Transfer Your Mind radio show and podcast. The last time he was on, he talked about his book, um, Never Go With Your Gut, which was a very interesting conversation. Now today, he is going to be talking to us on his latest book, which is called Resilience, Adapt and Plan for the New Abnormal After the COVID-19 Coronavirus Pandemic. As you guys all know, um, uh, we are going into some new norms, which, you know, if we looked at it years ago, it would be abnormal. So yeah, so that's going to be your conversation today. Um, And Dr. Gleb, you know, says that he has no crystal ball, right? As a behavioral economics and cognitive neuroscientist, his expertise is in recognizing the blind spots in our nature, cognitive biases that lead us to misperceive reality and make disastrous errors in our decision-making. These errors are costing Um, lives and ruining livelihoods. So please make use of the practical advice Dr. Gleb will share um, on this show today and that he has in his book. They will help you keep you safe and enable you to plan for the future in the new abnormal after the coronavirus pandemic. All right, so that was my introduction. So Dr. Gleb, Tell us um, what made you write the book, Resilience, Adapt and Plan for the New Abnormal of the COVID-19 Coronavirus Pandemic. What made me write the book is seeing a lot of folks make some bad decisions around the pandemic and their assumptions of what's going to happen after the pandemic. So that's what really drove me to write the book. When I was first investigating as a behavioral economist, cognitive neuroscientist, risk management expert, I've been long doing various sorts of future forecasting, future proofing, looking at the future and making sure that we see the future with our eyes open and we address the threats and maximize the opportunities that come to us in the future. So when I was first looking at COVID-19, when it was emerging in December, 2019, January, 2020, it was incredibly scary for me. And it was not scary for many people, which is not wise. So what I saw was that people were just dismissing it as something, oh, it's just kind of a disease in the middle of nowhere, China, Wuhan, China, right? Who heard of it? Well, when I started investigating it, what I found was that this is a huge city. It's 11 million people, produces over $22 billion in revenue. It's called the Chicago of China. It's kind of in the middle of China. It's a transportation hub, industrial hub, has over 200 international flights per day. And you know, with an average of 500 people per flight, that's 10,000 people going in and out. And it's a very well developed city, modern city. You know, China's a very well de- developed country in its metropolis area, metropolitan areas at least. And the medical infrastructure completely collapsed as a result of this virus. So it was pretty obvious to me that if the virus, the, the virus will get out it, elsewhere and that medical infrastructure will collapse in developed countries as well. But no one seemed to be taking it seriously. When you look at what was happening in January, February, this just wasn't a topic for discussion. And so I started writing about this, talking about this. I was one of those early people who forecast the dangers of the pandemic. I published about it in Business Insider and Columbus Dispatch. Now, Inc. Magazine, other venues early onward. And that, that's how I became known. That's how the publisher approached me to write my book, Resilience, Adapt and Plan for the New Abnormal of the COVID-19 Coronavirus Pandemic. 
So that's why they approached me. But the reason what drove me to write the book, so that's kind of the driving force of it. When the publishers saw my articles about it and they're like, oh, can you write a book about this topic? But this is really important. Clearly we're making some bad decisions around COVID-19 and how we'll recover from it and what will happen afterward. So that's what really drove me to write the book seeing the cognitive biases, the dangerous judgment errors that people were making around the pandemic and their false assumptions of what's going to happen afterward. Because, you know, we'll never go back to January, 2020. It's, it's a wonderful time, you know, but that's never something that's in our cards. And that's something that people want to go back to, that previous normal. And that's not what's going to happen. So that's those things drove me to write the book, helping people make better decisions during the remaining portions of COVID, the recovery from COVID, and then what the world will look like after COVID, based on my expertise of our foibles as human beings and my correct predictions in the early stages of the pandemic about how bad things would be. All right, so what made you just um, think, other than the fact that you're saying that Wuhan, you know, have 11 million people and have 250 flights going in and out per day. So um, was that the reason that you started writing articles earlier on when everybody was not taking it seriously? Um, you know, obviously we know that, you know, the, the Trump administration didn't take it seriously. They thought that it was something that was going to go away. Um, so what was, other than the, the, the sheer number of people um, in Wuhan and the fact that, you know, people were scattering all over the world because they're, they're going through Wuhan. What made, what were your earlier um, thoughts that this was gonna be something that was gonna stick around for a long time? Something that made me differ from many people was that I'm aware of cognitive biases, these dangerous judgment errors. Ah. And so being able to see the evidence makes me very clear on drawing out the trend lines from it. And the cognitive biases that we all experience make ordinary people, the Trump administration, journalists, folks who aren't really aware of these cognitive biases, unable to understand clearly what the future will bring and make draw implications from the pandemic. So for example, one of the biggest cognitive biases that causes us to make bad decisions, not simply around the pandemic, but any sort of situation that might result in a major disaster for ourselves personally, for our business, or for the world as a whole, is called the normalcy bias. Now, the normalcy bias refers to us perceiving that the future will be much like the past. That's our perception. That's the, what we feel like. So imagine yourself five years from now. If you think of yourself five years from now, you'll probably think of yourself as a slightly older, wiser version of your current self. That's what our intuition tells us. That's how we feel. Uh, look back at yourself five years ago. You'll probably realize that you are in many ways a different person than you are now. You had different values, different interests, some of different goals. Well, you know, that's if you have personal growth, but not a lot of people have personal growth. Some people stay the same. <laughs> some people stay the same, but most people don't. Okay. Most people change in some ways and they change their value sets, their life circumstances changes and so on. Okay. But what we don't think of is that in five years, we will be just as different as we were five years ago. It doesn't feel intuitive to us to feel that way, but that's exactly what will happen because we transform, we grow, we change. But this normalcy bias causes us to stick to our current condition, to perceive that things will stay on the same path. And when we see evidence, the clear evidence that I presented to you that you will be different in five years from now, it doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel realistic and we reject the evidence. It doesn't align with what we intuitively feel. That's what a cognitive bias is. When we feel well, that something is right, we believe it's right. When we feel something is true, we believe it's true, regardless of whether it's true or not. So we're unable to really make good predictions and trend lines. For example, the fiscal crisis of 2008, 2009, it was pretty clear that the rising houses prices was going to be unsustainable for houses, the, the bubble, right? 
right? was it was clear, but people kept buying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm a realtor, so I Houses. understand. They kept, you know, trying to I understand them. totally about that. You know, they're hoping. Yeah, yeah, that's it, right. Exactly. So, so they think the the intuition is to feel that the house prices will keep going up and you can keep doing this forever. Similarly, so clearly that's not the case. So you have to want to look at the trends and draw clear trends into the future and say, okay, because I have this feeling, this gut reaction, this normalcy bias, that the future will be much like today. I have to reject that feeling and look at the evidence and clearly judge from the evidence what will happen instead of just feeling the future will be similar. So if you look at the evidence of a very modern city, Wuhan, whose medical infrastructure completely collapses very quickly under the weight, the burden of this new disease, mm -hmm. and that you look at the evidence of those people scattering all over the world, then what's the natural implication conclusion of that? That means that infrastructure in other areas without interventions will also be as badly infa if affected, the medical infrastructure and so on, once the disease takes hold. And in fact, that's exactly what we saw in well-developed areas like Northern Italy. And what, what, why Northern Italy? Well, because Northern Italy, if you remember the early stages of the pandemic in the developed world, that's where the epicenter was. Northern Italy happens to be the area of Europe and the US that's most connected to Wuhan through its clothing trade. So you had the most people going to Northern Italy. And that's why Northern Italy was so badly impacted, so badly hurt mm -hmm. by the okay. pandemic. These people were not prepared for it and you had collapse of medical yeah. infrastructure. That, that's where you had death rates of 10% or more from COVID. Right. And you also had something similar in New York City in March. In New York, yeah, right. Yeah, I, I, I know that's where you were going with the New York City. Okay, exactly. so, um, so the cognitive bias is what you're saying that people um, look at the past and, you know, normalize the future. That's okay, right. so um, give me one cognitive bias that, that we did, or the, not we, the majority of the world did in, let's say, March, when this thing started to spring up. Give me well, a cognitive bias of that. Sure. What I saw happening then is not simply the normalcy bias, but another cognitive bias called anchoring. So Sorry? anchoring refers to us looking at what we first know about a topic and uh, first pieces of information and using that as a filter for all future subsequent information about a topic. And how this worked here was that people had previous information about, let's say, SARS or H1N1, right. other right. pandemics. Right. And they felt that, hey, this new pandemic would be just like that. When yeah. you had a lot of people who, when you heard reports from them, interviews with them, Early on the pandemic, they said, I didn't think it's a big deal. It just would be one of those, you know, SARS, whatever, right. the first one. It's not going to impact my life. It's not going to impact me. Right. And it's going to stay they... over there in China, which exactly. a lot of people expected because, yeah, you're, you're very right. Because the, co the, the coronavirus started in China, I think, mm -hmm. since in November. And nobody expected it to come this way because you're right. The SARS and so all the other... Um, the coronaviruses stayed isolated in maybe the African countries or some other countries. It didn't spread worldwide, I think, exactly. right? It, they didn't spread worldwide. The H1N1s did spread to America, but it wasn't nearly as bad as, right. it, as COVID. Okay. And what happened, what they didn't realize was that it started in these areas and but it didn't cause the collapse of a major modern medical infrastructure of a right. city. It wasn't nearly as bad. None of these coronaviruses were nearly as bad. They were not nearly as infectious mm -hmm. and they weren't nearly, so that was the big problem. They weren't nearly as infectious. So people were using their past information to judge all future events. Yeah. And we tend to do that all the time. 
when we let's say when we have romantic relationships i was just thinking that (laughs) (laughs) right you're in my head i was just thinking that when you're talking about past equal the future yes 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 yep yeah it's (laughs) like okay you know all men are like this or all women are like this or something like that right. based on a very limited sample right, right, of right. relationships, right? Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. perhaps it's just the people who are in our circle or who we happen to meet in bars or whatever, <laughs> who are <laughs> like that in certain ways. But we judge all the future, all of our interactions and in our relationships in this way. The same thing, let's say, with our professional relationships. You know, when we have a relationship with a boss, we tend to use that, the first relationship we have with the boss, we tend to use that to structure all of our future relationships with bosses. And that's a bad idea. Obviously, yeah. people are very different, but right. that's how we tend to think. That's how we tend to feel. So this is this anchoring causes us to make really bad decisions in a number of areas, including the coronavirus pandemic. And this is a, these are all things that we should talk about, of course, in how we think about the future, because we are right now anchored, still anchored to January 2020 as something that it will characterize the world after the pandemic. And of course it won't, but I don't want to jump there yet, but that's something for right, everyone right, to be right, thinking about. Right, right. The normalcy bias anchoring okay. are all applying to the world okay. after COVID. So what are, so, so I'm getting the conversation now. So because we anchored, we look at the past relation, the past coronaviruses, we look at the flu, because a lot of people were comparing it to the flu and yep. we made some bad decisions. Now I can understand the government making some bad decisions mm-hmm. and um, yeah. So the government made some bad decisions. You know, the people that were um, uh, mostly affected were the, the nursing homes. They made some bad decisions. You know, the medical staff made some bad decisions. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting that. So, so now it's here, mm-hmm. right? Um, what is the cognitive bias <laughs> that we need to remove in order to move forward? We mm-hmm. know now that um, it's different. We know now that we underestimated it. Um, and then now again, there's another strain that's happening. So yes. this is a very intelligent virus. Um, mm-hmm. it, it keeps changing a lot. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, so, so what are some of the, the cognitive bias that we have to make sure we don't have in order to survive in this new world? There are two that I want to draw our attention to. And the first one is called hyperbolic discounting. Now it's a fancy term for excessive discounting hyperbolic of the future. What we tend to do as human beings, our intuition, our feelings causes us to be very oriented toward the short term, toward what's going to happen in the next few moments and discount the importance of the long-term future. And so look at these new strains, right? So consider these new strains since you brought that up, I think it's a very important topic. What we saw and what we're seeing in the UK and South Africa where they originated Brazil is that they are much more infectious. They're maybe 50%, you know, anywhere from 40 to 70% more infectious. That's kind of what the information is. And the latest information is they're actually somewhat more deadly than the current strains. So we have some information on that. And they are somewhat less caught by our vaccines. So the vaccines are somewhat less effective. Maybe the effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine maybe goes from something like 90% to 70%. Now they're still effective, but not as effective. So what does that mean? (laughs) Well, what it means, uh, and they became dominant in the areas where they were introduced within a month or two, two for maybe three months. So what does that mean? Well, that means that they will become dominant in the US sometime by March or April of 2020. And the CDC study demonstrated- 2021. 2021, of course, (laughs) but March, April, sorry about that, (laughs) thanks. Well, so March, April, 2021. Now what happens when they become dominant? We only need to look at the example of what happened in the UK and South Africa and Brazil, that their caseload doubled over two weeks. 
So went from whatever they previously had to twice as much over two weeks. And what does that mean in the US? Well, in the US, we have something like just under 200,000 cases and our hospitals are already pretty overburdened. I mean, you know, the US has handled the COVID worse than any other developed country, let's be honest. And that's just yeah. the case. It's, it's been really, really bad in the US compared to other countries. So we're starting off at a much higher level than the UK is starting off or than South Africa is starting off off the caseloads. You know, there are many, many areas. I think the latest numbers I saw that was that 40% of Americans live in areas where ICU capacity in hospitals is under 15%. And that's what it means to be overstrained. And of course, if that's the case, then more people are dying if they're under 50% because they're getting worse care because there's, you know, people are, nurses right. are, and doctors are less able to take care of them. Wow. What happens when the numbers of people who are going to the hospitals literally double over two weeks, not figuratively double, <laughs> yeah, that when they actually double over two weeks, that's what it means for cases to double over two weeks. Eventually, several couple of weeks after cases double, those people end up in the hospital, whoever gets a worse case of COVID. And then our medical infrastructure will grow from strained to broken. That's just, they, they won't be able to fit all these people into hospitals. There'll be very much people who will need to wait until somebody dies before being able to, to get be admitted in. into hospitals, right? Wow. Which, wow. which is what happening in a number of rural areas. This is a very depressing conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not, uh, it, it, this is something that's a clear trend line, right? And this wow. is an example of what you just said. It's, uh, our intuition kind of rejects that information because it's not positive, it's not great. It's right. not something we want to believe, right? Right, right. But this is the clear trend line. If we draw the clear trend line, if we see what's happening in the UK and South Africa, and the CDC says this will become dominant by March or April, 2021 here, that means that the cases will double two weeks after it becomes dominant. And of course, they'll start shooting up as it slowly becomes dominant. So that is an incredibly scary proposition because we won't have nearly enough vaccination. Vaccination is going at a much slower rate than promised. You know, the Trump administration promised that they would so, vaccinate. So what is the solution? What is the, so it's not a cognitive bias, it's a fact. So how do we, what is your advice to anyone that's listening that, um, and how to prepare for that? What they need to do is prepare themselves and get into strict lockdown because if they get sick with COVID, they will be facing no prospect of getting into a hospital. It, it won't be realistic at that time into March or April. For these new strains are really, really, really dangerous, really bad. So you want to make sure that you don't need not simply medical care for COVID, which, you know, that's what I'm talking about, strict lockdown, but you don't do anything that might be somewhat dangerous. Don't go skiing, don't uh, travel, don't, do th don't use power tools around the house if you can help it. You know, th these are things that you should not be doing. You should be seeking to do everything possible to prevent yourself from needing emergency care in the next several months, especially in March or April, or March, April, May, as this becomes dominant, before we have nearly enough vaccination. You know, when you look at the vaccination, the Biden administration looking at the failures of the Trump administration when it said that you know, we'll have 20 million people vaccinated in December, we only had something like 2.5 million, we will not have widespread vaccination until the end of the summer, unfortunately. That's what kind of the eight months from so the- So this vaccination yeah. will help, you said not 100%, but- 90%, right. It's currently effective 90% against the old strain. It might be something like 70% effective against the, the new strains, strain. which is great. Okay. You know, 70% is good. You're, you know, m less than one third is likely to get sick with COVID, get sick with this okay. new strain. So you definitely okay. want that. That's great. Okay. But it's not, uh, you know, it's not as good as against the old strain. Hopefully the- do you, do you think the Trump, I mean, the Biden administration knows this trend, which is why they're aggressively trying to get the, the vaccine out? I think they are 
aware. They okay. probably don't want to panic people right. and talk about right. this. But if the CDC said themselves that the new strain becomes dominant by as early as March, if it becomes dominant, th this is a super clearly case study to look at UK and South Africa and say, this, this is what will happen. So we need yeah. to get vaccination. There's a reason there's such a push on vaccination. There's a reason there's such a push on st stricter lockdown measures. So you need to get yourself into strict lockdown because what will happen is that right now there's so much politicization around lockdowns, around so many new protests around lockdowns that the governors will not lock down in a timely manner to prevent the new strains from really, really, really hurting us. They, it's just very hard to do that. When you see what's happening in the UK, they, impo they imposed a very strict lockdown and then they had some protests. In the U US, there's much, much more protests likely to happen against any sort of strict lockdown and non-compliance. So you don't, we can't assume at all that the political authorities will handle this well. Unfortunately, I think the Biden administration will do what it can, which is pushing vaccination, but at the local and state levels, we should not assume competence and we're handling this effectively. So you need to protect yourself. You need to get ready by, like I said, by, for strict lockdown, you need to get supplies because there will be supply disruptions of various sorts. As this becomes major, you know, people will get, will get into panic buying again. There's no question about that. So there'll be panic buying, panic shopping. So you want to protect yourself now by securing supplies for yourself and your family. You also want I'm, to- I'm so uh, glad we're having this conversation. My goodness, I'm one of those ones with cognitive bias. So thank you for this information. I absolutely, you're scaring me. In fact, I'm traveling in a couple of days. Hmm. <laughs> but I guess it's not March or April, but yeah, so, all right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it's definitely scary information. And this is why when I was first researching about this, I wrote a white paper. I published a number of articles about this in early January, late uh, end of December, early January. Now, a number of editors weren't willing to take this information because they were saying, well, why, you know, this is really, you know, scary outside people. of, uh, scary to yeah, people, outside of the it. norms. Yeah. And then yeah. the CDC study came out saying that it will become likely dominant as early as March, proving my point, and that you know, made people more likely to take my articles. And I just had one published in right, right. Entrepreneur. Yeah, wow. so it's something, so you need to, again, take care of yourself. That's the emergency. Take care of the supplies for your house. Then if you, as much as possible, make sure that you are working from home. There are a number of employers who are making some bad decisions about get, getting people into the office right now when they don't need to be in the office. So you want to really talk to your boss about working from home as much as possible. And if you are the boss, let your team get your team into the home as much as possible because this will be a bad time. And if your boss is not willing to be flexible about that, see, you still have a couple of months and, uh, when you can see if you can make a career transition because you really don't want to be outside the house when you don't have to in this sort of wow. situation. That's good advice. While you were talking, I um, something popped into my head. So they were originally saying that if you caught the COVID, then you're immune for at least three months. Mm -hmm. what is the what is the science on that if you've mm -hmm. already okay. had COVID, can you catch this new strain of COVID? number one it's my mm -hmm. my first question and how long is your immunity that you can catch the old strain again is there do we have any information on that yet we know that the large majority, not everyone, who catches COVID the first time is protected for about at least six months of, after from the old strain of COVID. Okay. So that's something we know. We, there are cases where people do get reinfected, and that depends on their physiology, so on their body. But the large majority of people who get COVID are protected against the old strain, not so much against the new strain, because the new strain is somewhat mutated. So it's easier to catch the new strain if you had COVID before. I'm not sure, we don't have the science on exactly how much easier it is, but it is easier. So you want to, even if you had COVID before, you definitely want to be quite wary of this new strain because it is 
you're it's quite a bit more likely to catch it than the old strain if you had COVID before. Wow. All right. So, yes. oh, wow, that was some really good information. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, I think I'm going to air your, um, your, your, um, this interview earlier than I predicted so that we can get this information out. <laughs> it is very important information to get out to folks. I'm All right, absolutely. right. So, okay. So now let's transition into what your book talks about after mm -hmm. the pandemic <clears throat> yes. and the new normals. Mm -hmm. So how do we adapt from, to the new normal of working from home, social mm -hmm. distancing, loving the internet because all the bars are closed and the restaurants are yep. closed. What is your advice or what kind of, what kind of cognitive bias, since that's our word, do we need to adapt to handle mm -hmm. that? So what the cognitive bias that I think is really important is in addition to the kind of things I talked about before, it's called the planning fallacy. Now the planning fallacy talks about our plans. When we make plans, we think the world will go according to plan. That's how we feel. We like ourselves, we're confident about our plans. We're confident about what we do. And you, you've probably heard the phrase, failing to plan is planning to fail, right? Failing right. to plan mm -hmm. is planning to fail. Unfortunately, the planning fallacy is the idea, the reality that our plans will often not go according to plan. That phrase, failing to plan is planning to fail, is actually misleading because the reality, a much better phrase, is failing to plan for problems and risks is <laughs> failing to plan. That's the reality. And we will have various problems and various risks that derail our plans, but because of the planning fallacy, we don't realize that. We don't put in enough resources to adapt to a new situation that contingencies, risks, and problems, and we don't pivot our plans nearly as quickly as we should. So you want to be aware that your plans for a life after COVID and getting back to January 2020, which is the, what the vast majority of people think will happen, are is very unlikely to come true because the pandemic will and has already very much impacted our habits, our values, what we care about, our norms. The, think about people who have lived in a state of anxiety, a state of worry, concerns for this year. Do you think that hasn't changed their habits? Think about their values, what we value, what we care about. That's changed. Think about our habits. All of those things have changed. So we need to get ready for a world that after COVID will be still quite a bit more virtual than we may want it to be. The, who, yeah. the people who remember January 2020 and who remember how what the time was like. So yeah. for example, when you go out into the streets, let's say the pandemic ends and you know the everyone has a vaccine, we have herd immunity, which is great, that will be wonderful. How easy would it be for you to be in a crowd? It might seem, it might seem to you that you're eager, enthusiastic to go back to a festival or to go, right. to go, you know, to go to a bar or something like that. Yeah. But what will very likely happen is that you will feel anxious around right. other people. Yeah. And other people will feel anxious around other people. Yeah. So the, there will be many places that will reopen and many event venues that will try to hold events, but people will have a bad experience of them and they'll try to go out and they will have a bad anxiety ridden experience yeah. and they will not want to go yeah. out again. Yeah. They don't realize, we, don't, we find it very difficult to predict our future selves to predict our feelings. And so we have planning fallacy around this. We have planning fallacy about our plans. You know, it might feel that way, but we will be much less likely to interact with other people normally in the way that we interacted in January, 2020 after the pandemic, after we have a vaccine. So that's something for you to be thinking about very much that you know, if you have an event venue or if you're planning a party, it will be much, much more complex for people to not be anxious and to not deal with the values and habits that they had during the pandemic after the pandemic. So that's going to be something that remains. There are many other things, but I hear that you want to ask a question. So go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to comment on the fact that, yeah, way early on in um you know, on my interviews months ago, I was saying exactly the same thing. That now, even when somebody speaks to me on the road, 
um, because I know that the virus is transferred when people talk, you yes. know, it's the whatever. And I'm a very friendly, warm person, oh. but yet when someone talks to me, that's the first thing I'm thinking about. So I know yeah. that um, we're all going to be, we're all going to be changed mm -hmm. in, um, in a certain way. But a follow-up question would be, so you think that we're still going to have those feelings mm -hmm. about enjoying crowds and people, even when there's vaccines and mm -hmm. people are not dying anymore, maybe only 1% are dying from the COVID, or you think there's always going to be people dying from the COVID? I mean, I, I'm thinking that we're, we're going, we're going to go through the tunnel, but we're going to come out in the light. No? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's not going to be quite the case. So what will happen right now? We see that there is unfortunately a lot of vaccine hesitancy. And so a lot of people who aren't taking vaccines. And so that's going to be one dynamic, one problem. We hope and we ideally everyone will have a vaccine. But there are unfortunately too many vaccine skeptics who will not have a vaccine and who will still be vulnerable to COVID. So that's one thing to, to understand. So it won't be fully out of COVID. COVID will still be going on because of this vaccine skepticism and because some people will not want a shot. It will also be going on because COVID will keep mutating and uh, you'll have to have booster shots. How many people will come in for a booster shot? You know, people don't habitually come in for a booster shot, even for the flu, which kills right. something like 100,000 people a year, which right. is pretty bad, but many people don't come in for a booster shot for the flu. So we'll still have, be having COVID mutating, going around, and that will still be an issue. But even wow. more than that, the there will still be this anxiety, this uncertainty around people. It will be a very long time until it fades and it might never fade for many people. Because think about the situation. What is COVID? It is essentially a national trauma where, but definitely by the time the pandemic is largely over, we'll have over half a million people who died in the US. And that is a horrible thing. We, most of us know someone who has COVID and perhaps right. someone who has died of COVID. Right. And that is something to know and to understand that that's part of a national trauma that we're all going through. And that's right. not something that people are recognizing that this is a traumatic experience for the whole country. And we're traumatized by this disease that spreads between us, between people. <laughs> so how are we going to be relating to each other if we are aware that this is that we've spent two years being traumatized or however long by COVID until it's over. Our values, our norms, the way we interact each with each other, the way we feel about each other will very much be changed. We can't go back to that January 2020 when we just had that. You know, people right now are comfortable interacting with people, only those in their household, right? How right. are you going to be interacting with those who aren't from your household later? It will be much, much harder to get back to interacting in a friendly social way when you're after COVID, after widespread vaccination. It's just not going to be nearly as easy. So that's only one out of the many ways that will change. So I want to, to folks to be aware of that. The other way that will change is that much more of the world will stay virtual. For example, you know, let's say you're meeting with your insurance agent and the insurance agent, this is a notoriously well-known area where, where sales staff really like to meet with people face to face, right? That's something that folks really like to do. Or uh, both of us are coaches. So you're a life coach. I'm an executive coach. I coach executives. So it's very, it's better for, to do coaching face to face because I can observe all the things that are going on with their body, all the nuances respond immediately, but it's much more convenient and easy right. to meet like this, right? To meet right. virtually rather than meeting face to face. So how many service professionals, salespeople, people who are providing, let's say therapy or coaching services, other things like this, how many of them will go back to face-to-face? -to -face? I can guarantee to you 
that the large majority of service professionals want to go back to face to face. And I know that and I've spoken yeah, to them. Well, I'm a realtor and I have paid no attention to all the virtual stuff that they're doing because I'm thinking, boy, I'm biased. I'm thinking that we would go back to normal when this is done. So what you're telling me is that all our online presentations and they're doing showings now virtually that that's going to be around for a long time. Wow. Oh, yes, absolutely. I need to learn that. <laughs> yeah, you really should because you know, people will, why should people go and visit a house, especially when they still have these fears and anxieties around being with other people <laughs> wow. when they can actually, when they can do a virtual tour. Yes, right. Realtor is a perfect example. And there are many, many other examples like this. Right. Why should you do that? That will save you a lot of time. It will save you hassle. It will save you anxiety. It will save you worry. You know, do you know that your realtor has had a vaccine? What about these new strains of COVID that are mutating? Maybe you're more vulnerable to them if you haven't had a booster shot. Why should you place yourself in a risky situation? So this is going to be a situation definitely with realtors and many, many other areas where interactions will remain virtual as yeah. much as possible because this will be both more convenient and more safe. Wow. Yeah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is good stuff here. My goodness. All right. So now um, uh, talk about your book. Talk about, mm -hmm. you know, um, what are some of the things that you, you talk about in the book? You talk about resilience. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so tell us, um, uh, does your book cover anything that we haven't touched on here? Absolutely. So what my book talks about, some other things that it talks about is how businesses it talks about both individuals and businesses and talks about the specific ways that individuals and businesses can adapt to this new abnormal of the last stage of COVID and the post COVID recovery. How do you effectively collaborate virtually? For example, like you've said right now, you haven't taken some of the time that you maybe should have taken to learn the, these virtual tools and techniques. Right. right now we're having a lot of our meetings are going on virtually online. Right. How many people have taken the time to do a course in professional development on how to have effective virtual communication? Very few. Okay. And that's, I think, not a wise thing. I think it's very smart to actually get a lot of professional development in effective virtual communication. You'll do much better in your life in the future, not simply during COVID, but after COVID if you are a more effective virtual communicator than other folks, you can com compete more effectively with them and so on. So that's just one example. And there are many, many other examples in the book that I talk about how to effectively survive and thrive in the last stage of COVID and the post COVID recovery in our more virtual world, in a world characterized by more anxiety around interactions between people in a world where people are also more worried about things like supply chains that have been disrupted many times over. So how are you going to make sure that your supply chains are protected? So things for businesses and then for both individuals and for businesses. What you want to do because of our gut intuitions are really bad around COVID and how our world is disrupted, you need to make a strategic plan for yourself for the last stages of COVID and the post COVID recovery. So my book goes through the specific steps, the ways that you go about making a strategic plan for yourself as an individual. And if you are a business leader within a business or if you're a team leader within a team, you know, for yourself as a realtor, how do you make a strategic plan for yourself and your household in this new world, last stages of COVID and the post COVID reality? That's what you gotta be thinking about, this new world. You gotta overcome your intuitions which are going to lead you in the wrong direction. And to do that, the way to do that is to make an effective strategic plan. And that's what my book ends with. How do you make an effective strategic plan to survive and thrive in this new world? Yeah, that would be good information because yeah. Um, so there's hope, you know, we had a very doom and gloom conversation here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. but, but um, there's hope. There's hope if you make a strategic plan. Mm -hmm. There's hope that if you you don't um, you move out from your biases mm -hmm. about normalcy and and anchoring and 
and all those new words that I learned today. Um, so that's great. So how do listeners um, get a copy of your book and connect with you? I heard you mentioned that you also do executive coaching. Mm -hmm. So maybe um, uh, some, you know, some business people might be listening to the show and want to get some of your knowledge as far as mm -hmm. planning, because that's what coaches do. We yes. help people with their plans. How um, can someone get in touch with you? So my book is available in bookstores everywhere, but you might not want to visit them in person if you want to be safe. So again, the book is called Resilience, Adapt and Plan for the New Abnormal of the COVID-19 Coronavirus Pandemic. And it's available, of course, on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other online bookstores. So check it out there. My own resources, whether getting in touch with me or having blogs, videos, podcasts, articles, are going to be on disasteravoidanceexperts.com. Again, disasteravoidanceexperts.com. You especially want to check out disasteravoidanceexperts.com forward slash subscribe for a free eight video based course on making the wisest decisions and managing risks in our new world. So again, disasteravoidanceexperts.com forward slash subscribe for this free eight video based module course on making the wisest decisions in our new world. Oh, that's awesome. All right, well, one of the things I offer to my listeners is that um, a transcript of our conversation will be on the show page, which is blog.myhelps.us. And I will have the links to um, your book as well as your website so that anybody to head over to blog.myhelps.us will be able to, um, to link up with Dr. Gleb um, just in case they didn't catch, you know, the, um, the website. So, um, uh, listen, Dr. Gleb, this has been a very illuminating conversation for me. Um, you're making me feel badly because I was one of the ones that did not take this very seriously. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, like I told you, I'm traveling, mm -hmm. um, uh, in a couple of days. Uh, so, but anyway, yes, when I get back, I will make sure that I'm in, I was even thinking of going to the Super Bowl party. <laughs> mm, probably better idea. Yeah, right. So, right. You, I see you just slapped my wrist there. <laughs> <laughs> so I will reconsider that, definitely. Um, but anyway, listen, thank you very much for um, the information, the advice, um, the warnings, um, and um, uh, yeah, you know, letting us know that we need to be on lockdown, letting us know we need to, you know, get our supplies. Mm -hmm. Again, I wasn't even thinking of that. So mm -hmm. get the supplies. So very, very good conversation. Thank you very much um, uh, for all that. Um, uh, all right. So um, for those of you listening or watching on YouTube, definitely would like for you to um, subscribe to the channel. You know, this information that I'm sharing with you guys every week, it's life or death. I bring quality guests like Dr. Gleb on every week. So yes, definitely would love for you to subscribe if you're listening on iTunes to rate and review so that we'll be able to reach a wider audience. Um, you know, I'm also would like to invite you guys to my life, um, my Facebook group called Life Coach. Again, we have inspiration and and life coaches and coaches giving inspiration um, on a daily basis, including myself. So um, uh, that's all we have for today. Any last words, Dr. Gleb? Thank you for your kind words. And I encourage everyone to really not trust your intuitions on the pandemic. This is not something that we're used to and our intuitions will unfortunately cause us to make bad decisions. Yeah, like me here. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, thank you very much. And uh, until next time, namaste.